Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Tester. You know what I'd like to do on my show. I want to enlighten, inspire, and empower you to become your best self. Now, Scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on a fire. And today we want you fired up about the book, The Adventures of Princess Pauline, Prince Adumala Jr., and their blue dragon. So you know what I'm going to tell you to do. Go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee, or get your tea, because we are about to get Started. Good morning, Adimola. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you, Mom. I am so glad that you are here. Now, before we start talking about your book, um, I do want to give you an opportunity, as I do with all my guests, to introduce yourself to perhaps a few people out there who are unfamiliar with you or with your work. So my first question to you is, is what makes you, you? Um, I get things done if I have things I need to do. My background has shown that I've been able to do a lot of different uh, professions and different careers across my professional life. And uh, my writing, too, I've been able to write different books in different uh, topics on different styles. For children's an adult book. I I am a Nigerian Canadian. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I've been here since uh, January of 1997, just over 24 years. Uh, I like to tell stories that will excite people, that will increase their awareness about issues they never talked about, or broaden their knowledge and confirm what they already know. Mm -hmm. Now, being an author, Um, Is that something that you have always wanted to do, or did you just come upon uh, this later in life realizing that you could share uh, your message in book form? I never really planned to be an author. My background was uh, chemical engineering and uh, process engineering. And somewhere along the road, when I had uh, kids, I began to engage them in uh, stories that were excite their mind and expand their minds. You know, kids uh, have an open mind, they are curious, they want to know, they ask a lot of questions. And I felt the need to put something down that would portray that anybody can be a prince and princess. And I started to write this book, The Adventures of uh, Princess Pauline, Prince Ademola Jr., and their Blue Dragon just to portray possibilities of what one can do with uh, storytelling and adventures that they are making in uh, uh, Western Montemor, Galaziland, and amusement park in more. So that's how I kind of stumbled into writing from there. One thing led to the other. I got uh, very close to God and became a pastor. And from my work with God, the desire to express some of the things I learned from working with God came up on me and I decided to write more and more and more. Now, the title of your book, um, and you may have touched on it just a little, how did you determine that that would be the title of your book? Uh, Based on the total experience that I wanted to share, uh, that I want people to receive from the book, that was a kind of a submission of the total experience that people will get when they read the book. It's an adventure book of a little prince and a little princess. It shows how they grew from being little kids to become king and queen of their kingdom. So the whole story is kind of an adventure story. So that's how I came up with the title of the book. 
I love the fact that you are showing them as king and queen of their kingdom. I think for many people um, in the world, we forget that there are many kings and queens that happen to be of color, and especially those who happen to be of uh, African descent. So I think it is uh, beautiful that you that you are showing that for our beautiful black and brown uh, kids out there, so that they can see themselves represented in a in a book. So kudos to you for for doing that. Now, speaking of being an author, if I understand correctly, you have written other books as well. Are they children's books also? I've written uh, two other children's books and 16 other Christian, more motivational and inspirational books about different topics in Christianity and faith. There are a total of about 19 books I've published so far. Uh, the 20th in process of being published now. And there are some others I've written that I'm yet to publish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as uh, your books are concerned, um, I know that many people will say, you know, I'm going to write until I've I've run out of, of things to write about, um, and be it that that's one more book or ten more books. Do you feel that there are several more books in your future to be written? Yes, uh, there are several more books that uh are still to be written, like this particular children's book, there's supposed to be a sequel, a story, a continuation of story. I don't want to let out any secret yet, you know, that there's supposed to be a sequel of the book sometime. And uh, there is uh, uh, some other volumes of the books I've already written that I've yet to complete. But I don't know, you know, when you are writing, you need to have the uh, drive and passion and inspiration to do the right thing at that moment in time. Or that to be a laborious task. Then for now, I'm just trying to try and get these uh, few ones I've written to get them known, let people know about them, read them, so that when sequels, subsequent sequels come out in the future, people can flow with the story. Absolutely. Now, talking about uh, process. And for so many of the authors that I've spoken to, when they are in the writing process, they need to, you know, go off to themselves so that they're they're able to write. Um, children's book authors tend to have a little bit of a different um, way of doing things than do people who have written books that are strictly for adults. What was your process like for getting the story together um, in a way that you thought was appropriate for the children that you wanted to be able to share your message with? Uh, for this uh, particular children's book, I had to put myself, like uh, for my kids, when they were growing up, uh, when I was raising them, when they were much younger, uh, I made them to be my boss so that they would be feel free to relate and interact with me. I brought myself down to their level. So by being at their level there, I was able to operate and work with them and see things from their perspective. So when I was writing the book, it was very easy for me to write it from their level, the way they will accept and appreciate it, the way they do their things, as opposed from an adult perspective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, as far as the illustrations are concerned, Again, when you're writing for adults, you don't necessarily think about pictures, but that is so important when writing a children's book. You want to be able to have, you know, the right picture convey the right message. What was that process like for you? Was it difficult to find the right person to be your illustrator, or did you find that that was quite easy um, in that you were able to, um, they were able to see the vision of what you had for your book? Uh, at the beginning, in the uh, it was difficult to find uh, an illustrator to be able to not that they were not available, but what I had in mind, the cost was quite enormous. So I had to adjust the uh, the design to just a front cover illustration for now, 
a child moment we are working on the illustrated uh, version, full illustrated version of the book in Israel. We have uh, a good illustrator who's working with us and making the illustrated version of this book so that there will be a full picture book. You know, but um, it's quite a challenge because the cost of the book itself does go up quite uh, tremendously when illustration gets involved in it. Uh, people become difficult, uh, find it difficult to decide if they should, you know, spend so much on pictures or spend so much on stories. So we have the story version, which is the book form. Now, and the illustrated version will come up later. We are also hoping to do an adaptation, if I may say that uh, in this uh, moment, an adaptation to have a play or animated uh, version for TV or theater uh, production in the future. If we can find the right partners, we are still searching. Absolutely. Well, Ademola, it is time for us to go to break. But before we do, could you please remind everyone of the title of your book, where we can get a copy, and how do we stay in contact with you? The title of this book is The Adventures of Princess Pauline, Prince Ademola Jr., and their Blue Dragon. The hard copy and uh, ebook uh, copy can be found on Amazon. Um, you can also find it on our Admosh Store.com on Shopify, and also on um, uh, our horse market uh, website. You can reach me uh, via uh, Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle is uh, at Ademolaju. That's my first name and first letter of my last name. Gotcha. Alrighty, everyone. We are back. Thank you so much for joining me for our daily spot with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Butch-Chester. My guest today is Adimola Fuswalele, and we are talking about his book, The Adventures of Princess Pauline, Prince Adimala Jr. and their blue dragon. I love that. I love that because we get an opportunity to allow our children to dream, right? And it's like, of course, every little girl especially wants to be a princess who turns into a queen. So I think that that is absolutely adorable. I'm such a girly girl, so I love books that are like this to give our children the opportunity to use their imagination. Who knows what they're going to grow up to be. Now, my next question for you is about um, the the way in which you chose to publish your book. For so many authors, um, they choose to self-publish because they want to control the price. They want to make sure that they're getting, you know, as, as much uh, profit as possible for it. Others choose to use um, another a publishing house so that they don't have to worry about all of the things that come along with self-publishing. How did you determine which one was going to be best for you? Which one did you choose to go? Um, at the beginning, I wanted to do uh, traditional publishing, but uh, the way the story and book was written it was such that uh, my Kids, uh, at the Mola and Pauline, they were growing up so fast. I wanted them to be in the age group to be able to read the book before they had grow such kind of uh, children's book. Uh, I decided to go for self publishing. But after writing uh, a lot of different books and uh, doing a lot of self publishing, it's quite a lot of uh, work to do uh, self-publishing uh, because of some of the logistical constraints involved and the network. But uh, right now we've decided to put everything on uh, Amazon and uh, use the Amazon process. But we will 
if we find the uh, traditional publisher who's interested in working with us to transfer everything to their care so that I can concentrate more on writing. Because right now I'm having to do writing, administration, marketing, and so many other things, which is uh, taking quite a lot of my time. Absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing that because I know that that's a decision that many authors are trying to, uh, you know, to really figure out. Um, and I have found that so many people are choosing um, to, to not wait you know, to not allow their dream to be deferred because they're waiting for someone else's uh, time frame and they, they choose to take it into their own hands. So I, I definitely understand that. Now, as far as uh, this book is concerned, and you, you kind of touched on it a, a little bit earlier, and that is um, what are your hopes for this book? Do I understand that, that you want it to become a sequel, that, that you want it to be much more than just this written form? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, my plan for the book is uh, this first uh, uh, part or portion of it is to have the illustration uh, done, which we are doing right now. Uh, we also want to do adaptation or screenplay, uh, either in uh, live action or animation, any form of animation. And also, we also want to also adapt it for theater production so that children can go to the theater. Hopefully, when this COVID-19 and everything is all settled down, we can go to theater and sit down and watch it and enjoy it with our family. There's a plan to have a sequel. That the story has not ended. There's uh, more story to be told concerning this uh, book. As uh, time progresses, one will find time to complete that portion of the book and have it published. It might not be exactly the same title, but it will be a continuation of the story. Absolutely. And I, you know, I applaud you for, for that vision. And if you have it, that means that it is achievable. You know, uh, for so many people, yes. they, they kind of, I don't want to say they limit themselves, but they think, well, I've written the book and that's, that's all that you can do. It's, it's just a book. But, um, you have the vision to make it so much more. And I believe that you will be able to do more. And I love the fact that you want to, to make it into a play. And I think that is always a, a great way to reach a different audience. You know, for someone who, who simply wants to uh, see it acted out with real people and have the book come to life. I think that, that that's, that's amazing. So I, I definitely applaud you for that. I hope that God brings that to fruition for you. I think that's awesome. Absolutely. absolutely. Now, if there is um, a one particular message that you think that you have tried to convey with this adventurous book, what do you think that that is? What is the main message you want for the parents or even for the children to understand having read this book? Uh, the message I can give to children uh, or to parents is that uh, if you have any desire and dream for your kids or they have kids, the kids have dreams or desires for them, you can develop a structured process that will allow them to be able to achieve their dreams and objectives. And it's possible through volunteerism or actually doing some work experience or some internship or various different things of training. And it's possible that anybody can be a prince, anybody can be a princess. According to the word of God, you know, we are royal priesthood. So with that, that gives us that title of royal, royalty already. So if anybody has any doubts, you can go to the scriptures and confirm that. You are you are so right on on that. I remember um one year um I I was preaching for uh Women's Day at a particular church and I was talking about believing in that vision and, and believing in who you are told that you are. And I remember saying, you know, my dad, like my, my father, 
you know, told me I could be anything in the world. So I could be president of the United States if I wanted to be. You know, just as a little person, just telling me, filling my head with the possibility. And then, you know, growing into a woman and understanding what Scripture says as well and understanding that my Creator Father has told me uh, the same thing that I could be, you know, so much because he has given me permission to be that. And it was like, oh, my goodness, they should have told me that. The stars are, you know, I'm shooting for the stars. There. So it's like, that is awesome. But you are so right. We have to um, we have to instill that in our children and remind them of who they are according to God's word, not who man says they are, because, you know, man may live it our children, but when we know that we serve an awesome and mighty God, then we can do all that he just called us to be. So I love that. Thank you for for that reminder. Sure. Now, with everything that is going on in the world, and there's a lot, you know, pick your country, pick your time of day, there's stuff going on. Um, for so many people, they're trying to figure out books to read to their children that help them deal with a something that's going on in the world. How do you think that your book fits in with some stuff that's going on in the world right now? Or do you think that it just is a book that can bring comfort to children because it allows them to step away from the stuff going on in the world? Uh, I definitely believe that uh, this book can bring uh, comfort to children and to parents because uh, it pulls their minds in a certain direction and they look forward towards the end of the book with a focus to see what is going to happen next and it gives them a happy ending. An ending that gives a happy ending gives a very good and comforting feeling. There's no violence in it, there's no swear words, there's nothing uh, that can cause any kind of discomfort. It's all activity, 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 and goals and sets of objectives. And it helps to prepare their mind, you know, train their mind. It's like uh, it's, it's done in such a way that uh, when kids read the book, it opens up their mind into thinking that there are possibilities. Thinking about uh, Philippians 4.13 and 4.19, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, the Lord shall provide all, all my needs according to his riches and glory. You know, it helps to create that mindset in their mind that, yes, they can do this, they can do that, they can do whatever they plan to do. I love it. I love it. I definitely think that this book is going to give some inspiration uh, to our parents and to the kids out there. I love it. Now, last question for you. As far as the ideal reader is concerned, um, what age group do you think is perfect um, for uh, for this book? Would it would it include like our elementary school kids, like kindergarten through about fifth grade? Would it be okay for junior? Hi kids, maybe you know sixth or seventh grade as as well. We've seen uh, like in Canada here, we've seen kids in uh, grade three from grade three reading by themselves, three to five yeah. reading by themselves. You know, those of uh, maybe grade two and grade one, adult can read it to them if they are not able to handle some of the big words. It's but for in Africa, like Nigeria, where I'm from, it's approved for schools in uh, grade six, grade five, and grade seven. Thank you. Thank you I for that question. So it's like uh, if you're um, if if the child that you're purchasing it for uh, is a little younger than an older sibling, an older brother or sister, this would be great for them to read it to to their younger brother or sister. I love that because that just creates more family bond at time. So I, I think that I think that's awesome. I, I love it. I love it. Well, Adamola, thank you 
so much for spending time with us here today on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I have enjoyed my time with you, and I always love speaking with with children's book authors because you guys have a very special way of conveying your messages and making sure that the next generation is inspired. So thank you for for doing that. Now, before I let you go, though, if you could remind everyone, please, one last time, you are definitely on social media, and I love that. So if you can remind people of the title of your book, where they can get a copy, but please let us know, how do we follow you on social media and stay in contact with you that way as well? Uh, the title of this book is uh, The Adventures of Princess Pauline, Prince Ademola Jr., and the Abdul Dragon. It's available on uh, Amazon.com. Uh, in paperback and in uh, uh, ebooks. It's also available on uh, the Admovish store on Shopify. It's also available in uh, horsemarket.com. Uh, for following me, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, uh, is there for my name at the Mola House one of them. My handle is uh, at uh, Lorum or more. Or our Instagram as Ademola U, or our commercial site is uh, at Horse Market. The Facebook is uh, Ademola Usonele, that's my name there. The handle is Ademola Usonele. Thank you. Thank you again for being a guest on the show. And listeners, thank you for spending some time with us here as well. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember that you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Buckchester. You know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten you, inspire you, and empower you to become your best self. Now, scripture reminds us of the tons of a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today, we want you fired up about sci-fi. That's right. We're talking about self-examination, about physics, about AI. My guest today is Thomas Bram, and we're talking about his book, The Woven Sun. So you know what I'm going to tell you to do? Go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee or get your tea, because we are about to get started. Good morning, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining me here on Daily Spark with Dr. Insula. Good morning. Good morning. Now, before we start talking about your book, as is custom here, we always like to give our authors an opportunity to introduce themselves to perhaps those one or two people out there that are unfamiliar with you or with your work. So my first question to you is, is what makes you, you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. um, I came to America about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, I would say to be exact, and I came here to sort of get a better education and to expand myself to be a better person in a way. Um, I also go to church now these days. I mean, I go to church now, so that's one of the good things. Um, usually I go to Times Square Church, which is a very, very good church, very big church, very good. Um, Right now, it's more or less when I get up in the morning sometimes. You know, if I can get up early enough, I do my usual prayers or sometimes I listen to my gospel music. And sometimes I also call up my friends if they need prayers and stuff like that. So that's the um, other side of me. Um, also, what do you think? Um try to more or less try to do a lot of other stuff with my friends and stuff like that. So that's why. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I can, I can understand that. And we do have to make sure 
that we are still, you know, staying in contact with folks, even though COVID has kind of put a, put in, has put a dampen on, uh, many of our activities. Um, it's still good that we, that we're able to, to be with them as much as we possibly can, even if that's just on FaceTime. So I have to agree with you, um, on, on that. Now, being an author, is that something that you've always wanted to do, or did you find that that was something that came a little bit later on in life? Uh, something I would say that came a little bit later on in life, because originally I wanted to be a doctor, and I mean, it wasn't so bad an idea in terms of becoming a doctor and helping people, because originally it would be like, okay, I will be a doctor, I will make enough money, maybe go out there, open up my own practice, and help as many people as I could help. Because I always thought that, you know, being a doctor was something that's very uplifting and it helps people. So that was one thing that I wanted to do more so than anything, more so than write. Um, I think also part of it is like you look at life as to say, you know, yeah, I was looking at life as to say, okay, what is my contribution? What can I do to make other people's life better? So I thought it being a doctor was the primary thing that um, I found very, very uplifting and very fulfilling. Um, later on, um, what happened was um, during the course then of my life, I sort of uh, started to have an interest in other things in science, but I decided to be a um, eventually become a writer because the writing would be a good way to express how I feel or what I believe in. So it wasn't necessarily the first thing in my life. Um, the first thing was always to be a doctor. And the funny thing is sometimes I got cousins that are nurses and sometimes they would say something and I kind of maybe barely remember <laughs> what you know, right. they're talking right. about because, you know, I, I kind of started studying medical books and stuff like that. So my interest really at first was to be a doctor. Um, right. the writing just sort of was uh, secondary. Absolutely. Now, you have written the book, The Woven Sun. I like that title. It is quite interesting. How did you come about the title, The Woven Sun? Well, I sort of came across that title because originally the first book that I was supposed to write was supposed to be called The Sons of God, The Children of God, more title, better title, The Children of God. But um, that title had to be halted because I had to include certain aspects within the story. So I called the story, the woman, I came up with the title, The Woven Son. Because basically, the story revolves more or less kind of around the sun, but um, the sun basically um, is almost like, I guess you would say maybe kind of the way life, you know, influence how, you know, life is influenced. So the woven sun was the title that I got because I wanted to put something that would circle how people get influenced by a certain object or certain things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, what drove you to write the book? Was there a particular thing that inspired you that to really kind of give you a push to say, now is the time to get this book out? Well, um, I would say what inspired me was maybe the sort of a seeking to sort of maybe create, I would say, a link between science and to some degree religion, so to speak. But I'm a Christian, so basically I don't want to make it sound like it's just pure religion, religion, you know. Um, So I would say between science and, in a way, how humanity relates to what God has given them, wisdom and knowledge. So that kind of inspired me to write a book, because you want to 
sort of a tell a story. You want to be able to convey it to a writer, to people out there who might read, who read the book or who could read the book. You know, a sense of uh, understanding that might be a little bit different. So I felt like, okay, if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to do something, let that be my inspiration. Let people read the book. And if they get them thinking or even considering things, maybe on a different aspect, then I think, you know, that that would be good, you know, because at the end of the day, I think, <laughs> you know, I think we are trying somehow to convey ourselves to other people, whether it's on the street or. So, Thomas, my next question for you is, is that um, there is some religious overtone in the book. And um, why did you choose to uh, include those bits and pieces in the book as well? Why was it important to um, uh, include that that aspect of of life? Well, I believe in many times you gotta give credit. I would say to what credit is due. Um, if you know, I believe you know you go through a certain situation, and if someone can help you then at least you have to give that person credit, you know. So um, being a Christian is such a part of my life that I believe it would be almost impossible to write a book without including many aspects um, how things basically can be better on the, if you follow a certain path. So that was the reason in putting... A certain amount of religious aspect within the book. Um, I suppose, you know, writing within the book that, you know, certain things in which we can, certain right. in which right. we can follow, we can best. Now, the, the flip side follow. of the point is that you have also made sure to include um, some science in the book as well. Um, why was it important to make sure that you address the physics part of of universal dynamics as well. Well, I think it's important to put the physics part of universal dynamics because I'm trying to more or less make a connection to many aspects, um, in including the physical dynamic, is to also give a different understanding on how things begin. Or how things work to an end. So putting the physical dynamic in it also helps to a good degree um, to make the connection that it's not just telling a story, but it's also about a story and the individual parts of the story that makes the whole story as a whole. So the physical dynamic, the religious aspect of it, all of it is the story as a whole. Not just, um, not just one side or the other side. It's the two sides working together to so to more or less um, to confirm each other, so to speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I can definitely, I can definitely understand understand that. Now, one of the themes uh, of the story has to do with uh, humans and the need to address advanced robotic uh, or ro- advanced uh, robotic beings. Why was it important to um, address the the AI portion of it? Um, why 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 go that far? Some people are that kind of frightens some folks. You know the the whole AI aspect of things. Why did you think that it was important that we address that? Well, I believe in addressing it. I think it is important to address it because. Eventually, the idea of AI, we're going to eventually come across it in a stage where we've, if we create AI so advanced, then there must be in some way a reflection of us because an auto engineer will create an automobile. He's mm-hmm. not likely to create an airplane. So, um, not seeking to make it seem somewhat, um, um, how should I put it? To make it somewhat cliche You know, I don't want to say, okay, the bad guy creates bad machines and the good guy creates good machines. But to the extent that if we do create good AIs, we create AI, we have to try to create them with the sense that 
they can do what is right. And even if they're confronted in a situation mm-hmm. where with, um, they have a choice between the right and the wrong, they will choose always the path that is right. So I believe in telling that side of the story, putting it in, in the book, I believe it may gives, it gives us somewhat of a sort of a, a guidance, so to speak. Mm-hmm, okay, mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I think, yeah. No, I totally, I totally understand what, what what you're talking about because you know any any resource, any tool, any um thing that we are given, depending on who we are, is how we will utilize it. You know, you can you can use medicine uh to help and heal or to harm. So um, ab- absolutely, you know, uh, even facts. I think that the world over, we can see that. You can use facts in a way, you can use facts in a way that will, um, you know, create a dynamic that can harm people. You can use facts in a way that enlighten people and allow them to, to make proper decisions. So absolutely, you are, you are so right with that. Well, Thomas, it's time for us to go to break, but before we do, can you remind everyone, please, what is the title of your book? Where shall we get a copy? And how um, should we stay in contact with you? Okay, the title of my book is The Woven Sun by Thomas Brand. You can get a copy on Amazon. Um, you can stay in contact with me with my email. It's Mateo, M-A-T-E-U-S-D-E-N, 5 Six one at gmail dot com. Alrighty, everyone. Now you know where you can get a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Budshista. My guest today is Thomas Graham, and we are talking about his book, The Woven Sun. Now, I love that we are not only just talking sci-fi, but we are taking all aspects of, you know, self-examination and physics and AI and uh, ARB and kind of, you know, molding them all together with a sprinkling of, you know, religious theory in there. So it really um, touches on all aspects of who we are as human beings. Now, Thomas, my next question for you, speaking of ARB, um, if I'm understanding correctly, in your book, the mission of ARB was to protect the technology. Um to to make sure that things didn't go awry, you know, that stuff didn't just get all chaotic. Can you explain a little bit more about that theory that you address in in the book? Okay, that theory, um, looking at it from all of our perspective or our point of view, it's almost as if, um, you have your son, he graduated college, you give him a brand new car now. You put obviously limit on what he can do. He has, he has to, or rather society put limits on what he can not do. You can't go beyond 65 miles an hour. You can't do certain things. You can't go wheeling in the middle of the parking lot. The technology that was set on the planet was given in many aspects for them to even further the advancement of science. But if it should fall into the wrong hand, then you're going to have a problem. In the same way, a parent may be able to tell her her son, or a mother may be able to tell her son, her father tell his daughter, you know, this is the rules that we have to keep, you know, in order for you to, not just for yourself, it's also to protect others too. So that was part of the reason why. Um the AI was said that it was not just so much to protect themselves, but that if it falls into the hand of the wrong person or the wrong aliens, then we'll use it against someone else. And there's no guarantee that that will be beneficial. So the only way you can do that is to make sure the machines that you have in command or at least in control keeps those technology in their possession. Absolutely. I, I, I totally, I have to totally agree with you. I'm sitting here and I, I, I'm thinking it's like, yeah, we see what happens when, you know, Thanos gets all the jewels. 
You know, it's like in the seven <laughs> figures, everything, you know, uh-huh. goes wrong. So it's like, yeah. absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. so it's like, good yeah. guys need to be in control of the button or the door. Yeah. You know, so absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you there. Now, speaking of those safeguards, you, you've made, um, a point to make sure that, uh, Apollo 4, if, if mm-hmm. I, if I'm understanding correctly, was passed. Yes. To being the safeguard of the woven sun, and yeah. and and to make sure that series five everything that everything was just so. How did you determine in your book that who was going to be in charge of of what, and why was it important that they that they keep those particular dynamics in place? Okay, in terms of why Apollo four was chosen. Um, he becomes the latest and the most advanced AI. Not that he's saying the other AI wasn't particularly as advanced, but Apollo 4 becomes the most advanced AI at that stage that they could create. And the woven sun about it has a certain aspect about it that basically with the machines there, it could convey everything about the woven sun, how it was made and everything else. But Apollo 4 was the one who was given the most in terms of responsibility, he was the one that was given much in almost like a biblical way, you know, he who much is given much is expected. He was given the most advanced, the most responsibility. So him being given all of that knowledge, he was the only one that could basically safeguard the very technology, who safeguard the sun itself from any influence of anyone else. So that was basically the reason. It's like, you know, you have two kids in a room and, you know, you tell the adults that has greater wisdom, this is how you take care of your younger siblings. So there is that sense that, that he is the much more advanced and much more better of the others. So that's kind of the reason why we kind of sort of uh, make him as the sort of guardian of the, the, the situation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I love it. Now, for so many of the authors that I've talked to, you, um, their goal is to have written just, you know, I wrote the story about the Angela, that's it. You know, my goal is, is not to write anymore. I think I've done all that God wants me to do. But then I speak to some other authors, and they're like, absolutely not. I have been bitten by the writer's bug. I am going to keep <laughs> going. You know, it's like, I love it. Who knew? I love it. Yeah. So my question to you is, where do you think that you fall? Will you continue to um, to write more? Um, along this line, or, or even if you choose to, to change subject matter, do you think that there are more books in your future? Yes, I believe I'll write more along this line. Um, the Woven Sun um, is, I would say, book one of the series. I have two other books I'm currently working on. Um, so those two other books basically still continue the situation where we have, you know, the second book, Red of the Woman's Son, and the third one is going to be called Descendants. Um, not meaning to get too far ahead, but the last book is, the machine is basically, is to advance the idea of how much AI, creating AI, what will make them behave the way they do. In other words, is it a matter of choice? Would they be following? Or would they be doing things simply because they believe they have the freedom to do it. So within that concept, I'm going to continue down that line there. So I do intend on finishing that. Okay, um, that. Yeah. So I also intend on also finishing up other story. Like I'm working also on Legion RAM. So that's another story. I deal a little bit with AI, but it's mostly um, the how human interact if they're given certain knowledge and certain ideas. So, I would say three other stories. So the Woven, the Woven Sun series continuing, and then the Legion series continuing too. Absolutely. Um, and I think that most people enjoy a really good sci-fi movie and book. You know, I, I think about when you, when you were just describing there about, you know, which way do we, do we go? Um, it mm-hmm. made me think about the movie, uh, iRobot with Will Smith. 
and and thinking that oh my goodness are all the robots gonna you know lose their lose their mind so to speak yeah. but how even in the adjustment they they learn um uh, even though they grow i think it is our minds who feel that they will go bad because mm-hmm. people can go bad so yeah. it, it really it really is you know how we tend to look at ourselves we kind of project onto how we think that AI is going to uh, react or behave according to how we how we see ourselves. I think it's going to be amazing. Definitely, please keep writing. Keep writing. It is always fascinating how authors will will spin it and take you on the journey, and it's always fun to go on the on the journey with you. So that's that's awesome. Uh, when you get those completed, don't forget to come back and visit with us and share. Um, I, I think that um, that the listeners will definitely enjoy that book as well. Well, Thomas Graham, thank you so much for spending time with us here today on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I have totally enjoyed speaking with you today. Now, before I let you go, though, can you remind everyone one last time the title of your book, where can we get a copy? And if someone wants to reach out to you or, you know, just stay in contact with you, how should they do that? Okay, so the title of the book is The Wolf is Fun by Thomas Graham, available on Amazon. Um, and if you want to get in contact with me or any comment about the book, um, you can contact me at my email, Mateus, M-A-T-E-U-S-D-E-N-561 at gmail.com. Mateus Dan, 561 at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Thank you again for being a guest on Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. Okay, thank you, Dr. Angela. Mm-hmm. And listeners, thank you for tuning in as well. We appreciate your spending some time with us here today. I hope that we have enlightened, inspired, and empowered you as well. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember that you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. So